Uh, let's call this meeting to order. Um, our finance committee meeting of March 30th. Uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of the March 20 March 2nd uh, minutes. Uh, may I have a motion to approve those minutes? Moved. I have a second. 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 All right. Any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none. Let's uh, vote to approve the minutes. Uh, all those uh, by approving say, I'm sorry, by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So minutes are approved. Uh, let me, I, I wanna make a comment about the agenda and this is an, my oversight, I, I apologize for it. It did not include as item really five should be member comments. So we will open at the end of the meeting comments from any members that, uh, like to make a, uh, a comment about our proceedings today. Um, and another comment, uh, another uh, that I want to uh, mention to all of you is our next meeting this April 27th, uh, we will open it up to members attend in person. Uh, our members are able to attend in Zoom like today, but we'll open up the meetings uh, as well for them to attend here in person at, at this meeting. And we'll follow the same procedure at the end of the meeting. Uh, we'll allow them to make any comments with reference to the proceedings of that day. So uh, we're back to a regular opening meetings, uh, members attending as well as uh, as, as well as Zoom. So uh, and let's... Alex, do you want to highlight the calendar that's in there? Oh yeah, okay. If you want, yeah, I had that on, I had that in the calendar. I had two things on. Yeah, there on in your package today is uh, the uh, calendar our meetings for the next twelve months. Um, so, uh, these are for you. I know that, uh, Paul, you, uh, we'll get that to you by email, Paul. Uh, I know that you had asked for this, uh, but you have the, uh, the meetings, uh, scheduled for the next 12 months. Ellen, would you go ahead and just email the, the full committee, of um, the schedule, then they all have it electronically. Sure. Yeah, let's, let's be sure that uh, it also gets posted on the website yeah. so that people are uh, aware of what- We're gonna uh, wait for the board to approve their schedule on Monday or on um, Thursday, and then we'll post both. So we are gonna get some breaks during the year. Uh, not gonna have as extensive year uh, this coming year. Uh, we got some breaks. Uh, but if something comes up, obviously, you know, we may have to call the meeting, the emergency meeting at, at any time. But this is what we uh, have planned right now. Okay, so so everybody has that. All right, let's get to the uh, the big event today is uh, the presentation by uh, Ian McGetty, uh who is our reserve specialist. Uh, he's been doing our reserve study for this is the third year. Uh, he's conducting that study. Um, so we want to hear what. Uh, he has to say with reference to uh, 2021 and what can we looking forward to in 2022. So Ian, you have the floor. Perfect, thank you everybody. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, do not know me, my name is Ian McGeady. Um, I own the Association Reserves office here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And over the last three plus years, we have been your reserve study provider. Uh, so I am a accredited reserve specialist. So our industry has um, that certification that's given through CAI. Um, and it, it's still a fairly, although we, we have, you know, sometimes it feels like an endless amount of clients. We, I'm reserve specialist number 359 and the reserve specialist accreditation has been going for 25 plus years. So it's still a very small industry. There's not a lot of people that do what we do. And I always say it's simple what we do. It's just not easy. So um, working through reserve studies, Day in, day out is all we do. We're not doing any sort of engineering projects or any sort of um, trying to do a reserve study to get our foot in the door for something else. This is what we do 24-7. Um, we do, out of our office, a couple hundred reserve studies every year. And nationally, we're doing a few thousand reserve studies every year. So we have 13 offices throughout the country, um, mostly on the West Coast, one in Washington State, six in California, and one in Arizona. Um, and the reason for that is on the West Coast, especially California and Washington, there are state laws around reserve studies being required on an annual basis. Um, those laws have not come out uh, really to the Carolinas at all. Um, 
there's a light kind of a, a, a very loose, poorly written law, I'll say, in Virginia, but there are really no reserve study laws that are concrete in um, the Carolinas. So um, that's hopefully something that we're going to see here in the next couple of years, especially as I talk through today, understanding the importance of a reserve study and why it's something that should be uh, occurring on site at least every three years. Um, and, you know, my, my, my thought is every association, especially when they get 10 plus years old, should have at least one reserve study done. And many clients um, do not have that. So um, for those of you who don't know what a reserve study is, right? When you have HOA dues that you're paying on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis, a portion of that goes to operating accounts. So maintenance, fees, uh, landscaping, whatever it is. And then a portion of that is also going to your reserve account. And reserve accounts are for long-term um, assets that's owned by the association that they're responsible for replacing. Now, most associations we work with, as you can imagine, if you've lived in uh, you know, a smaller association, maybe some trails, a small pool area, a parking lot, uh, you know, we're talking, I would say on average, you know, 40 to 60 components. Um, Kiowa Island has about almost 800 funded components out of their reserve study. So it's a very unique situation when it comes to clients that we work with, with you know, that are your size. Um, and it's not rare, right? We've actually been selected. Uh, we finished the report a couple of years ago, but we were selected as the reserve study provider for Charleston County. So they did a countywide reserve study. We inventoried every single county owned building in Charleston County. Um, and for those of you, obviously you guys live there, but I knew Charleston well, I knew the area. I did not realize until doing that project how spread out Charleston County is. So it's a very long area that runs along the coast. So any fire station you see, EMS station, the detention center, um, you know, their big office buildings, whatever it may be, we've been inside there, we've done their reserve study, and that's something that we're hoping to update soon. So my point is Keough Island is obviously a large client, but by, you know, you know, no means that the largest we've done, but definitely, you know, I'd say in the top 2% of clients that, that we'll see um, every year. So, you know, what we're trying to do is when we show up to a client site um, and we're, we're working through what is going to be included in this, right? For you all, we, we start with is above, above a minimum cost threshold. Is it a common area component? And then obviously, does it have a predictable useful life and remaining useful life? So once we're going through that National Reserve Study Standards test, we start to itemize, we start to measure, we start to inventory, and then we start to do condition assessments on each component. And all we're trying to do here is help you all plan and budget for the future. Um, sometimes I joke with Shannon, as soon as the reserve studies turned in, sometimes within an hour, maybe a couple of days, it all, you know, not that it's out of date, but things are changing, things are being moved around, projects are being adjusted. So this is a simple guide for very long-term projects to help our clients manage and, and try to plan as best they can for these inevitable projects. Now, I will say for you all, being with an association that's this size, and I'm going to hop into sharing my screen real quickly here. Um, there's a couple of numbers that we want to look at when we're looking at a reserve study on you know, what the numbers mean, how we look at other associations and kind of what things that we're gonna be working through. Um, by the way, if any questions come up about a specific topic that I'm covering, I'm happy for you all to jump in, just, um, just let me know. So what we're gonna look at here is um, uh, the most recent reserve study that we had that ended December, 2021, and um, go through some of the key numbers, what they mean. Can you guys see the three minute executive summary now? Yes, sir. Okay. So these are numbers that basically, once we have this component list, right? The component list is, and I'll just zoom down really quickly here. It's basically your inventory. So all your items for this one, your walking bridges, boardwalks. Once all of those have been inventoried, that's what we base, you know, really the foundation of a reserve study. So once you have each component, the title, the useful life, so how long it's supposed to last, the remaining useful life, depending on when it was installed, how long it has left before we assume full replacement, and then the current estimated cost. So once we have all of those, now we start to build the funding plan. And that starts with what the starting reserve balance is, where we think we should be in regards to the deterioration that has already occurred, and then looking at a couple other factors of 
um, you know, how much cash flow is coming in every year, what type of project costs we're looking at, those types of things. So just to highlight a couple of numbers here, right? The projected starting reserve balance, this number is estimated to, to be what is in the reserve account on a given day. You know, basically we try to do it at the end of the year. So that's kind of what our starting point of where we're building from when it comes to our financial recommendations. Now, this next number here seems pretty high, 23.6 million. That's your current fully funded reserve balance. So that number is essentially, if you took all of the deterioration that has already occurred, that would be equivalent estimated to be that number. So let me elaborate a little further on that. If you have a component that has cost $100,000 and lasts 10 years, Inflation, all the adjustments aside, interest. After five years for that 10 year component, so we're halfway through that life cycle, that $100,000 component should have $50,000 saved up to that point for that given component. And that component, if it was just one component, you had 50,000 saved, you would be fully funded up to that point with the understanding that we're still working to save that, that next amount. And I'll get into kind of a, a a more detailed look at this in a little bit. But that number for most associations is a very critical number uh, because, and again, I apologize, you know, Keo Island is very unique. So I'm going to keep coming back to this because I want you guys to understand what the numbers truly mean for Keo Island is that most associations will have, we have a, a, a factor in our report called the Swain factor. And what that means is that very, um, few associations are set up like Kiwa Island. And so a lot of associations will have one or two components out of, let's say, their 60 components that make up a huge chunk of their reserve contributions. So, for example, I had a client last week, um, just like you all, how you own your roadways. They owned their roadways as well, but they were a much smaller community. They had gate systems, a clubhouse, you know, the list goes on. 91% of their reserve contributions were going towards roadways. And so what that means is, even if that's phased over the course of two years, right, we don't want to phase it much more than that, because one, if you can get it all done in one year, great, but very few associations can carry that much. Um, you know, they're usually behind the eight ball, so trying to avoid a special assessment. What that means is you have to really strive to be fully funded because if you don't, when that road project comes up, doesn't matter how well you've been doing with your reserves, 91% of this association's cash is coming out in the course of two years. Mm -hmm. So for many of our clients, we put them on a path to get to be fully funded, which is a great goal. Um, for you all, after you know working on this now for three years, working with Shannon and team, we're looking at two factors and we're looking at what are our estimated reserve expenses year over year? And what kind of revenue, what kind of cash flow we have coming in to the reserve account? So when we're looking at those two numbers for Kiowa, we see a correlation of the cash inflow. Now, this year is an anomaly, but let's just say in most years, the cash inflow is being somewhat fairly equal. And I'm going to hop down to this chart, somewhat fairly equal to... Um, what is the expected reserve expenses for that year? And so having a fully funded balance goal is not realistic for a client the size of Kiowa, right? Shannon and I joked, could you imagine in you know, X amount of years having 40, 50 million in the bank? It's just not needed because two factors. One, you've got a very um, large community there and you've got stable reserve contributions you know, we've talked about in, in, in the four to $5 million range, plus the home sales coming in. Um, so, you know, we, we've got some outside factors here that are kind of an extra cushion. And then we look at this reserve expense estimated chart. Now I know we've gone a little higher this year, but again, that's the point of a reserve study. Things change. We understand that. When you look at reserve expenses for a, a given year, um, versus reserve contributions, you know, there's not a lot of years where the expenses normally are going to be above the reserve contributions for that year. So you can see how even with this projection, we're getting towards a, you know, a 70% range. And then obviously based on inflation, you know, being around a 60% goal um, after 30 years, I know that's a long time, but that's how long our reports go over. You know, it, it, it's a, 
it's very impressive for, I'll say, for a community of this size to be this well-funded already. Um, you know, many community associations that we work with initially are going to be, to be honest, below 25%. They just don't know what they have, what they need to save for. So to have an association of this size that's this well-funded, that understands the importance of these long-term projects, because you all are a very unique association. Everybody I talk to, and I tell Shannon this all the time, I always mention Kiowa Island because you guys have, are kind of a, um, you know, the, the standard that's set for large communities, right? You've got a world-renowned golf course there. You've got beautiful high-end homes, a, a beautiful community um, that's been kept up with for, you know, decades now. And so it, it's just a testament to how long you guys have been working at this. But also we understand that the, you know, the, um, the quality and the aesthetics and the importance of that in Kiowa is also different from other communities. You guys are kind of set apart in that way as well. So it's important that we keep pushing, increasing reserves, making sure that we are um, keeping an eye on what projects are coming, you know, coming up. But again, um, having a goal of even a 50% funding level after the course of this entire report um, is a very realistic goal to avoid any sort of cash flow issues, any sort of, um, you know, deferred maintenance, anything like that. Because, you know, even having a, um, uh, and you can see down here, again, I know this is after 30 years, so bear with me, a 60% funding goal, it's estimated to have $47 million in the starting reserve balance. So what I try to do, especially for association of this size, we try to really focus on the next five to 10 years, the numbers are a little more realistic. But um, again, something to kind of keep an eye on um, as we kind of go through this process and the reserve study gets updated and those types of things. So um, again, it's a very unique situation with Kiowa. 100% as a funding goal is not something that we want to really put on the association because it's not needed. And as mentioned before, many associations have a really high in, in the course of 30 years, two years that completely overwhelm all the other 28. And that's not the case with you all. Um, funding is, is spread out fairly evenly. Uh, and I'll actually hop up to a chart to kind of show you that a, a little in a little more detail, because it is important to understand how different that is for associations. So looking at this um, reserve expense chart, most associations will have really low really low expenses and then these really high ones that are out in 10, 20, 30 years. For many years, right, basically until let's just say 2040, now I know we had a big jump this year, but it's estimated that we're going to have fairly consistent reserve expenses year over year. So that helps you all plan um, for, you know, each year, understanding that a lot of those costs are going to be spread out fairly evenly. Um, so that's a, um, a huge benefit to you all having an association like this. Um, so one thing I did want to touch on, and we can kind of hop back up to the top here. So for last year, um, working with Shannon and team, we've got some estimations in here. And again, over the course of 30 years, we have to build an interest in inflation. It's just a must. We had about 2.5% and 4% inflation. Uh, most likely, I'm going to be jumping this up to about 5% this year. I know we've seen much higher inflation than that over the course of the last two years. But when we think of this report being built and for the course of the next 30 years, we can't use really anything. Um, I try not to go above six. Some of our smaller clients, I'm trying to motivate them to really save and understand if inflation continues at, you know, north of 3%, what they need to be doing. But I've had clients say, hey, you know, can we use 9% as an inflation? Well, over 30 years, that's ridiculous. And it's gonna, things are going to be very inflated. So our expectation, you know, when you look at the next 20 to 25 years, that things will absolutely be um, leveled out when it comes to inflation rate. Things can't continue the way they are. And, you know, obviously the last two years have been a complete anomaly for all of our clients. Um, project costs going up very drastically, supply chains, labor, all of that. So... Um, Ian? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Can I just ask a quick question so that I know what uh, we're looking at here? Um, this page, if you just scroll up a little bit so I can see the whole page, it says report period January 1, 2021 through December of 21. Correct. Um, so is this last year's report that you are in the process of updating or is Correct. this? Correct. Okay. And yep. then it says it's 
All right, so it says findings, recommendations as of January 1, 2021. Um, so is this really, this is last year's report? Correct. So we're in the process and actually your next report is going to be for your 2023 fiscal year. So my goal is to have that back within a week. Um, just some rough numbers update with the understanding that Shannon and I are going to be discussing this again in Q4 and seeing where the reserve balance is at and um, what projects did we fully you know, complete this year. So um, yes, these numbers will change year over year. I know there's a much higher starting reserve balance this year, but then we also have about um, I believe about $8 million worth of projects. So at the end of the day, I don't see the numbers being that drastically different um, just because of how many projects you all have. But yes, there will be some significant changes when it comes to the projects being updated um, and those types of things. So that will be coming fairly soon here. But just to get an idea of what these numbers mean, kind of the idea this, you know, of, of how all of this is, is found, that's obviously not going to change year over year. Yeah. Okay. I, I got it. The, yeah, the no second uh, question I have, uh, and this is probably to the finance committee more generally, um, in the policy that we have that governs our uh, MR and our reserve, the board added a statement that reads, Quote, the end goal is to maintain up to 50% funded level over the life of the infrastructure replacement schedule, and then references the reserve study. So is that 50% goal equivalent to this percent funded number that's on this page? Are they the same definitions? Uh, in my response would be, I believe so. I, th I think that's what they were hinting at. So trying to stay above that 50% target line of being a, you know, 50% funded, as it were. Um, and so what that means is you have enough money that's offset the 50% of the deterioration that has already occurred. Now, again, that number seems lower, obviously much lower than 100%, but I can assure you that with the association of this size, with the amount of cash flow coming in, um, that's a very safe position to be in when it comes to your reserve funds. And again, with things being updated on an annual basis right now, if there, are, if there are any kind of big changes, like, you know, we had a, a large project cost year in, uh, in 2022, I guess you've got some big projects now, and I know there's a lot of roadways that are going to be done later in the year. Um, the reserve can absorb those costs, and now we can kind of start fresh that next year and, and start to plan again. So um, in short, I believe that that's what that statement meant. You're correct. Perfect. Thank you. And, and I also had a comment to make here. Sure. Um, in, in the investment policy, there is a stipulation. I think I'm correct in saying I don't have it in front of me, but I think it, I'm correct in saying that in the reserve policy, there is a stipulation that the board will approve the inflation rate, the relevant inflation rate to be used in the reserve study. So I guess my point is the two and a half percent and the four percent are were numbers that Ian came up with, and I have no reason to doubt their relevance. But did the board approve those numbers? I, I don't. If I have, I'd have to read. I'd have I to go back and look at it, but I'll, I'll I don't, check it. I don't believe that the board determined the inflation rate. I think no. it was a targeted inflation rate. Correct. Yeah, and normally, I mean, I. I not that the board approved the inflation rate. Because our reserve specialist is the one who determines the inflation rates. Well, again, I, I don't have yeah. the language in front of me, but I, my recollection, which certainly could be flawed, is that the policy stipulates that the association, the board, the finance committee, I'm not sure the, the subject uh, of the sentence, will establish a relevant South Carolina construction inflation rate. Okay. As a target. Correct. Okay. This, so, this so, would be a target that we would have that target. Okay, but is my question is, is that the board approved target? So can I hop in real quick here? So yeah. what, what that might mean is like an on an annual increase, right? So if we go from year 2021 to year 2022, it might be what we want to use as the inflation rate based on that year. But 
that that's happened with other clients, but I can tell you no clients have ever been responsible for the 30 year inflation rate. Just okay. Because so Ian, I, Ian, hang on just a second. I'm, ma I'm making a different point. The investment policy is geared to create a financial return. And again, I can't remember the exact language, a financial return in our investments that is at least the level of the South Carolina construction uh, inflation rate as a target. Okay, so it's not it's not anything that Ian McGeady is going to. I'm not I'm not quibbling with his numbers. My my point is the policy suggests that Kika establishes what it believes to be the target. Now, if it believes it's two fifty and four and four percent, fine. My question is, did we do that? So here's what the policy states, because I pulled it real quick. It says the long-term objective of the fund and make sure that I'm quoting the right section. The long-term objective of the fund is to achieve a total return equivalent to or greater than the construction rate inflation rate referenced in Kika's reserve study plus 1%. So your target is to the inflation rate as listed plus one percent. Okay, is that four percent? Is the number that you just described four percent? It would be plus one percent over this. So, so four percent is wrong. No, four yeah. percent is right here. Yeah. The board's yeah. using using this yes. as the benchmark plus one percent to get the return on their investments. Right. Okay. Okay, I, that's a, I see that distinction. That's on, again, long term. Yes. It, it's not one specific year, it's over a long term. Now, one year you may not meet it, one year you may surpass it, right? right. But over a long period of time is when you got to gauge it. Right, because I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to try to every year to say, yes. this is our target, this is our target, this is our target. Because they it's want the investments. It's over a long period of time. Just like the right. reserve is over a long period of time, 40 year term. And they want the investments working to support this infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Actually, the reserve is perpetual. Yeah. Oh, okay. For long, very long term. It's perpetual. Yeah. <laughs> okay. As long as there's a, a key cap. Right. Yes. Right. As long as there's a key cap. And I will say, just in, in my opinion, on, on being a reserve specialist, you know, my goal is to always try to be a little more conservative with that. I've never published a reserve study to a client having an interest rate over the inflation rate. Of course, that can happen. Um, and as sorry, don't you know the gentleman that was just mentioning, that's not the goal every year, right? It's over the long term to have a goal like that. That's great. But you know, if Shannon came back to me and said, hey, we made 6% last year, interest was four, I'm not going to have a 2% delta for 30 years because your, your, your interest would be, again, much higher, in my opinion, than most. And to be honest, now, you guys are, again, a unique situation with how much money you have in your, your reserve account, but most clients right now are seeing about a 0.3 return, 0.4 return, point, so basically less than half a percent. So that's, yeah, again- I think it was two years ago, Ian, that our investment return showed 8% return. Exactly. I remember that. I remember there was only I mean, a so digit year. It, so what does that mean? Okay, that over a long period of time, we'd have to measure it. One year, we may be lower. Than exactly. Else. So we did. As a matter of fact, I think and the first year that we had the investment fund, it was a negative. Okay. Negative that yep. year for reasons. I don't know what it, exactly what it was, but there was negative. And then one year, we had 8%. So it, it's a, it, you have to measure it over a long period of time. I agree. Okay. Now, that's got to be a target every year. We got to watch it. There's no doubt. Yeah, this, this is it. one of the sensitivities right. to, to Paul's to question it. about what are sensitivities related to, to the in, to the reserve study. Certainly material costs and, you yeah. know, inflation rates are cash flow. And right. if our cla cash flow is interrupted, those are sensitivities right. that the finance committee has to keep in mind when they're looking at their reserve study and your investments and how it's all working together. And the other thing to keep, that's correct, Shannon. The, the other thing that the committee needs to keep in mind that building in an inflation rate is appropriate and important, but don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of the fact that building that in to our reserve analysis um, does not provide us with inflation protection. In this instance, it provides us with 
a 49% inflation protection because our reserve is only 49% right, of the future costs. Correct. Yeah. Well, but yeah, just like we've talked also, Paul, the fact that there is no insurance factor in this reserve. I mean, Ian does not take into consideration that if there was a hurricane, we have to replace one of these assets. Yeah. We'd go into the reserve fund. The insurance may, you know, contribute some of that at cost. Correct. He doesn't have that factor in there either. No. So no, there are there are no, factors. Sure. No, sure. Right. Yeah. But there are so there are factors that will complement. One will be a negative, one will be a positive. I mean, is what you're saying. So they, they're all, and that's why we have a reserve special that's telling us after looking at all of these, this is where you should be at. This is what I recommend we should be at, basically, right? Yes. So this is all this is all great discussion. So I very much appreciate this. But there was a comment just made. I apologize. I, I can't remember who said it. Um, you said something about forty nine percent inflation protection. That's that's not technically true because if you if this reserve balance went up a hundred percent next year, let's just use the numbers that are in front of us. If this reserve funding balance doubled next year for a hundred percent, right? You'd be at about forty six million. Technically, you still have eleven million in the bank, right? again, hypothetically, according to these two numbers. So we would still be at about 25% funded. So that's not how a reserve works is you still have quite a bit more money to play with, even if things doubled in cost year over year in this situation, you would still have 10 million, or I'll say 11 million to deal with about $46 million worth of um, deterioration that has already occurred. So, and again, that's, it, it's not really a good way to look at the numbers because you know things obviously we saw this year obviously roofing um lumber those types of things went way up some things came down when it comes to the actual the, the goods but you know labor went up supply chains got a little more expensive so anyway um i'm i'm almost always well, i'll tell you i'm always going to keep especially for you all going to keep no matter what the return is the interest a little south of what the inflation rate is just for a more of a conservative approach. And Shannon and I have a discussion every year to say, here's what we made last year in interest. Okay, let's look at that compared to last year, what our projections were, maybe adjust a little bit. But again, my hope is that you guys have a great next 10 years of investments and you know blow the numbers out of the water. And that's just a little more cushion for your reserve account. Um, and again, that's why the numbers get adjusted every year. So um, I, I like your kind of line of thinking there, and 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 definitely we're going to stay, you know, abreast of kind of what's going on when it comes to um, you know these types of numbers. So another thing I wanted to touch on briefly, right, um, is the large projects you guys are doing this year with with roadways, for example. Um, another reason to have a, a well-funded reserve, which you guys do, and having money come in um, from different different avenues when it comes to building your reserve account is the ability to have a very large economies of scale when it comes to doing certain projects. So I can't remember exactly what, what, what the, um, I'm sure there's definitely a, a number of savings when it comes to, you know, doing a 10% project versus a 50% project, those types of things. But um, we see that time and time again with a lot of our clients is that if they have the ability to do larger projects at one time, that that is obviously the way to go. Um, I'm working with a client right now, long story short, they've got four buildings, they don't have enough money to do all four buildings in one year, and they're having to, it's actually on the West Coast, and they're having to rent a helicopter to fly in the materials. So if they could do it all in one year, the helicopter could drop off three, four different buildings with the material, and, you know, they're done, but that's not going to happen, they're probably going to do it over two, maybe three years, having to pay those, those fees helicopter fees, the, um, and again, I know that's a, a random thing, but there's still crane fees or still different things like that. So my point is economies of scale can be very powerful when it comes to saving money in the long term, although the short term obviously is going to be a little more painful. Um, so being able to undertake a, you know, three and a half ish million dollar road, well, probably $4 million roadway project now um, allows you all to, to save money at the end of the day. It just might not seem like that in that given year. Um, you know, another thing, and again, um, I'm hopefully to be working with you all for many years, but with an association of this size, um, I would definitely continue to recommend obviously on-site visits every three years, but that we have so many changes year over year, these no-site visits have been fairly valuable, valuable to you all. 
Um, and I do want to mention as well, um, I know I mentioned this the last time we had a mini kind of a smaller meeting, but that you all have access, especially the finance committee, to our Uplanet software. And so Uplanet is a proprietary software we've created here at Association Reserves that allows you, the board, the finance committee, whoever, to go into your reserve study in your client center and play with the numbers. Um, now you guys have you know 700 plus components. So I'm assuming those numbers would stay fairly um, stable, but if you wanted to mess with those, you can. But what it allows you to do is look at different reserve contribution factors, um, inflation rates, playing with those, interest rates, if, int if interest started to outpace your inflation and you started to have some really good years on return, what does that do to the numbers? So it allows you to run really what, endless what if scenarios. And it obviously doesn't allow you to print out a reserve study, but it allows you to print 90% of the reports that are found in our reserve study to share on a future committee meeting, to share with unit owners, to share with really whoever, to show kind of how the numbers can be adjusted year over year. So that is a powerful tool. If anybody wants to be, have access to that, just let Shannon know and I can get you signed up and get you uh, sent over a, um, an email to kind of register. But that comes free of charge being a, a client of, of, of Association Reserves. Um, hey, Ian, I have a question. This is Jim yeah, sure. Garella. Sure. Um, this three to $4 million road renovation that we're making now to get all our mm -hmm. roads up to very good quality. How is that going to affect your overall study next year of this $23 million to be fully funded? Will yeah. it be reduced from like 23 million down to 20? James, you nailed it, right? So basically how we look at a reserve study, right? Um, is let's say you've got, let's just use an example of the roadways, right? You've got all of your roadways at this $23 million. So this $23 million numbers in our example right now is representative of all your roadways. If you did all those roadway projects right now, that, that all those remaining useful lives are now reset to a, a full useful, to basically, you know, a, a new product, years, so maybe. a full yeah. useful life, right? To, well, right. to be honest, most, most clients right now are seeing 18 to 22, but um, right. anyway, my point is, and James, you nailed it, is that all that useful life's reset. So now, the current, current fully funded reserve balance is only equating for having one year saved for said assets. So yes, our, our hope is that, that I, will, I know it'll, it'll come down quite a bit when all those roads are reset to, to useful life. Um, now, obviously mm -hmm. costs have increased the last couple of years, so it probably won't come down as much as we, we may have thought, but yes, in, in absolutely when large projects like that and mass quantities have basically been updated that starting reserve balance will then creep back down so that's a really good point to make that that number doesn't always keep going up when we do a large batch of projects that are expensive and are carrying a lot of you know weight on the reserve um fully funded balance number that will come back down with the understanding that the reserve balance is going to drop a bit as well but hopefully those numbers will um will offset and that the percent funded stays fairly similar. So great point you bring up there. Ian, Ian this is Alex. Uh, so let, let me ask you another question. Now that the board has established a different parameter for our roads, a higher parameter for our roads, sure. instead of depreciating them over you know, a longer period of time, in your study now you will show the new standard, the new policy. Instead of doing it, I mean, I, I would imagine the roads are not going to last as long because now we're going only to excellent and, and good, right? Yeah. Uh, and going having fair or right. poor roads. Is your projection now going to be shorter? Because you know that in, in lieu of every 15 years, now it's every 10 years. Right. So he'd have to shorten, he'd have to shorten the useful life on the roads. Right. And um, the and other thing... Roads. On yeah. all roads. All and the then roads. the other thing that he's going to um, have to do, which we've talked about um, certainly last fall, is the board's idea of batching ro roads together for economy of scale. So that, right. you know, yeah. there's there's years where we're not doing any paving, and then there's a batch again for economy of scale. And we're going to a similar policy on some amenities of the quality of the amenities that, you know, again, we rated them and we're going to dispose of any poor or any uh, fair uh, amenities 
and we're just going to excellent and good amenities. Trails. Like the trails. trails. So I would imagine you would, you're going to have to make sure that that is in your study now. That This is what he does every the life, year. The lifespan <laughs> is shorter now. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And again, these are big changes, right? When we first started with you all, we had a, you know, another plan to do some sort of um, uh, basically a road rejuvenation projects. Right. Um, talking with Shannon, talking with, you know, the engineering team um, and things change, right? So we had a much higher decades and decades of, of road, ex, you know, expectations that they would last the project with the, you know, re, um, rejuvenation with Will and team, you know, things changed a little bit. So again, there's major changes year over year when it comes to this reserve study. So nothing set in stone. Um, I will say, you know, my hope is that, um, you know, you've obviously got your main, you've kind of got main roads, your secondary roads, even tertiary roads. So my hope is that some roads that have, you know, the beautiful tree cover that have less sun exposure, that have less people going, you know, faster on it might see longer useful lives. Um, there's a whole nother thing on when roads were laid, you know, the roads that are being done now versus in December, you know, there's factors. So it's going to be, it's not going to be kind of uh, an exact science, but yes, in short, useful lives will be truncated um, and, uh, you know, adjusted year over year. And that's why, you know, working with you all and you guys staying involved with the reserve study company is going to allow, hey, this, these, this batch of roads went south after eight years. I think we might need to kind of do a chunk over there um, where this other section of roads might last 12, 15, whatever. So again, it's, it's not going to be an exact science, but we're going to do our best to adjust things to try and help, you know, these estimated um, useful lives and, and obviously the budgets that are going to correlate to them. That's, so. that's a very good point, Ian. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought through all of that yet as, you know, a small cul-de-sac that's hardly ever traveled that's being paved right now is going to last a lot longer than Governor's Drive or Bufflehead sure. Drive. Sure. which are taking constant traffic. Right. So yeah, now they'll probably, we probably need to, sorry to cut you off, keep going. No, we probably just need to think through the roads that way. Yeah, that's, that's and, pretty and easy again, to do. my thought would be that I'm hoping, and I know they are, but they're probably using a different quality of asphalt uh, and different um, milling and, and depths and, and all of that on those main roads that people are going. I think it's what, 30, is it 30 miles an hour? What, what are your main road speed limits? 30 now. 30 okay. So again, they will, and again, another big one is the oxidation from the sun. So there's many of those tertiary roads that are very covered, like I mentioned, and, and we will see the oxid, you know, oxid, the oxidizing of the actual aggregate asphalt material um, take a little longer. So there's a lot of factors here. Um, now, freeze-thaw cycles, I know you guys don't get as many as you know, some of our other clients, but um, that will probably be fairly consistent across the island. But uh, and yeah, and then the final one, and this is nothing to do with anybody or you know, my responsibility, but there's gonna be areas that are gonna erode quicker, maybe a tree issue here or there. So there's always gonna be those annual repairs that have to happen, but um, yes, in short, things will be adjusted and we'll, we'll tweak year over year, depending on what we see that happening on site. Okay, and I'll go back with Tony. We'll look at the roads and we'll give a first swag at what we think they are. Sure. Um, and Shannon, I mean, another one thing I want to do is, you know, I th I've reached out to them once, but have a, a real conversation with, you know, your, your asphalt vendor as well to see what their expectation is, just to see if it lines up with ours. But I will tell yeah. you, and again, this was somewhat before my time, but talking to Robert Nordland, who's our founder and CEO, you know, asphalt roads back in the day could last 30 plus years. The material was, was much different, much stronger. Oil compounds were much better. Um, and now we see some mountain roads with our clients that last less than eight years. Now, some of them are chip and seal, which is kind of a, um, you know, excuse me, but like a crappier way to do roadways when they have to be repaved that quickly. But, um, you know, it, it's just not as sufficient as, as what you guys are going to see on, on the island. But, Yes, in short, roads have definitely seen a um, a downward trend when it comes to their their useful life. Yeah, we can send a note over. We'll send a note over to banks and we'll ask for an estimated useful life on what they're putting down now. Yeah, and don't obviously don't don't show your cards, right? I'm obviously going to be interested to see what they say. Um, 
And I don't think, and we've talked about this before, yes, repairs, but I don't think that resealing or anything like that, especially with Kiowa Island, is going to help those roadways last longer. An asphalt company might tell you that, but I've yet to see that unless clients are doing it very aggressively. So I just think having a resurfacing plan with repairs where needed is what we're going to do moving forward. So um, awesome. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. Um, So just kind of recommendations to you all as a finance committee. Um, You know, uh, I think you guys are all very responsible when it comes to what projects are coming up and, and, and what's, what's critical, right? And, and when I talk to deferred maintenance with Shannon, it's not something you guys ever, ever have to think about, which is a really good thing. But obviously building exteriors, windows, doors, roofing, siding, those are always my most critical, right? You don't have too many major structures there, but um, the ones that you do have, um, you know, making sure that those are all waterproof, those things are inspected, you know, any issues are repaired quickly. That's really the only thing that can catch you off guard from a, uh, a standpoint of, you know, a project cost going up fairly drastically when it comes to a building envelope getting compromised or something like that. But, um, you know, as things expand, if things are added, um, I don't know if there's any long-term plans on building new structures or something like that, but obviously the initial capital, if something is not in place, um, that's got to come from a some sort of capital plan or some sort of other funding. I like to protect the reserve fund and technically reserves are only for existing common area components. Now, that being said, if there's an expansion needed at the front gate because you're getting a lot of traffic and we need an extra lane, well, that's a natural progression of that asset, of that component. That could technically be a reserve expense. Sometimes clients still like to handle those as a capital improvement just to be safe. But just to kind of let you know, uh, just as if you were, you know, expanding, um, you know, an existing trail to serve more people uh, in your community, that again, most times clients will handle that as a reserve expense, depending on how well funded their reserve is, first and foremost. Um, But yes, anything that's added, anything that's new, as soon as that's done, that can now be added as a reserve component. And we immediately begin funding for those for those um, a good, yeah, you, uh, good, good question uh we're doing an improvement at the front gate presently in sure. order to cars to okay is that a new capital expense it's reserved a, yeah. it's can, reserved yeah can yeah something like that if, if usually if it's an existing gate and you're expanding it or you're changing it in any way um i w- if the cash is there i recommend handling that as a reserve cost because that's reserve. truly what that's truly what it should be but if Shannon came to me and said, hey, we're cut out this whole new area, we're installing a $300,000 brand new gate guardhouse that's not even existing right now, that would be something that's different. But yeah, if you most, now- we have, Our most recent example was the flood management projects, right? Because we're building new infrastructure for drainage. So we assess the membership. You all are building these capital items for your drainage system. And then once completed, like we completed the Pond 30 outfall, we sent those plans to Ian and said, okay, Ian, the membership is built it out of their special assessment. Now here's the plans you added in now as components and it becomes part of the reserve study. So this committee is very good about protecting their reserve. Awesome. Um, well. are, you guys, are you guys close to Dunes West? I know it's in Charleston. Um, it's on the other side of the city. Okay. So they're another client of ours. We've done about 10 reserve study updates for them. Um, and they're another example. They had old guard houses. They are building brand new ones, but those are to replace said old ones. So again, that's a reserve expense. So I think you guys get that. I'm not going to kind of go into further detail, but um, again, just kind of how you look at things, what you're budgeting for, what's a reserve item, what's a capital item those types of things. So um, if there's any questions about that, let me know. But um, that's so kind of everything that. that I wanted to run through. So, I get a good, uh, go ahead. Ian, I get a good question because that this is a discussion that we've had before. You know, how do we make that judgment? Is it a new capital expense or should it be charged? So our, our point now is that management, Shannon checks with you or you know, at least, you know, exchange notes with you and you say, yes, I agree. That should be part of the reserve. Yep. Exactly. So we just go or, or you say no. I don't know. I think that's got to be new capital. Right. 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 Exactly. And that was a discussion when we were doing the flood management projects. Okay. So 
Now, one of the other questions that so Paul... That's, that's, our, that's yeah. our checkpoint. I mean, that we know that whenever that Twenty happens, one. Shannon and Ian are, uh, are exchanging notes to say, okay, yes, go ahead and use the reserve or no, you need to, you know, you need to get new capital for, for that. Experience. One of the other questions that Paul Hennessy had raised was um, not reserve or operating, but reserve or depreciation. Um, and so there's another segment there. So for instance, some associations that Ian would represent would have HVAC systems or maybe vehicle fleet in their reserve study because it's a huge expense for them. Um, Kika chooses not to. Right. We've removed all of those from our reserve study. They're handled as part of depreciation funds, not part of our reserves. Right. And so for depreciation funds, it's, it's generally a life over a year, but less than seven and over a value of 25 months. And then the reserve study is taking over it assets that are over seven years and over a thousand in value though. Ian doesn't like our thousand in value. Sometimes he bumps us up a little bit. <laughs> He's like, you don't yeah, want that like, in there. I mean, a thousand for you all is, you know, it's like a, it's, a, 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 I know, it's, it's like, it's like a ham sandwich. So, so, but there's, there's differences in associations as to what they'll put in reserves. Right. has made management decisions to treat some things that could be in reserves as depreciation instead. Sorry, go ahead, Ian. My no, apologies. Good. So this is the last kind of chart I just wanted to show you. This is a component significance chart. So I just wanted to touch briefly on what this means and, and how well you guys are doing against it. So going back to before the fully funded reserve balance, this is kind of a, a, um, an extension of that, but let's just take a, a roadway here. Um, so let's take uh, you know this random road right here, right? Bobcat Lane. So this is obviously a different useful life, but it doesn't matter for this example. What we're doing here is we're taking a useful life, the, the, the current estimated cost for said component, dividing by its useful life, and you get a specific number for each and every component. So when you go down to the bottom, you get an annual deterioration cost, which again, this is, has gone up a little bit, but you get an annual deterioration cost of about 3.6 million. So what that means is that most clients that we work with are behind that number and we're trying to get them to surpass that number because that number is basically the minimum deterioration that is occurring every year. So it's almost like an annual bill on what we should be paying. And so the fact that we're trying to get, you know, you know, now north of like about 4.1 puts us in another more conservative position to make sure that we are trying to outpace that annual deterioration cost. So you can imagine with most most clients that just to, to give you know a, a, a scale, if if most clients are at 3.5 million, a normal client would be at about I'd say about a million dollars. So now we're trying to get them to almost 4x their reserve contributions in a very short amount of time, because every year that they're not at that number or surpassing it, that you know, deterioration cost is outpacing what they're putting into the reserves. That's not the case for you all. So again, that's another really good test on how we're doing and where we should be when it comes to our reserve expenditures. So um, again, I try to tell most clients this should be our minimum. You guys have already surpassed that. And it's something that we're going to continue to obviously build and work towards. But again, I just wanted to touch on that because that is a key number that our report can provide to our clients to let them know how they're doing what, with, with the ongoing deterioration that's occurring. Um, so I don't know if there was anything else specific. Shannon, I know I covered all your questions that you and I had discussed. Um, was there anything else right now? I know, I mean, I can hang out for a little longer, but any, any other questions from, from the team that you guys wanted to go over anything know, specific? Um, one of the things, and it's not so much for Ian as it was for me, was Paul Hennessy had asked questions about our landscape projects. Sure. Uh, specifically. So in the reserve study, what Ian does is he has an allowance for them, an annual allowance that we're doing landscape capital improvement projects. So for us, that was passed back in 2000 to allow for landscape capital improvement projects. And I pulled the language. It was related to 
the installation of irrigation systems, tree replacement, new install, removal of invasive non-native species or other such large landscape projects as approved by the board of directors because they wanted to continue to reinvest in their community so that Kiowa didn't become tired, right? We wanted to hold property values. So for Kika, what that means, what you'll see in our LCI projects is irrigation systems, complete renovations of cul-de-sacs. If we go in and we completely redo your irrigation and redo your cul-de-sac or large common area spaces, for instance, Doug's gonna do some line of sight work and he's gonna completely redo whole triangle sections of landscape um, or special land and lake projects. For instance, if we're gonna go in and when we did, you probably remember along Governor's Drive and Ocean Course Drive when we were renovating it by sections that was coming out of those landscape capital improvement funds. The one question we get the most comments on is the pond project. Why is the pond project in there? And the way we built that project, this project is now in its fourth year. We have 122 ponds and they were overgrown for 20 years. So what we're doing is we're renovating our ponds. So we're going into an entire pond, we're renovating the entire pond, we're cutting back the overgrowth, we're replanting along edges. Now that supports our drainage system, right? Because our drainage system doesn't need all that debris in it, but it also supports the health of our pond. So we're, instead of renovating land, we're renovating pond. Um, it's all done by an outside contractor. This isn't done by us. If we're doing small pond areas, that's coming out of operating. And we do do that. If we're just maintaining view windows and pruning to open up views in the winter, that's coming out of our operating budgets. This is renovation of our ponds. And I asked Matt this morning, because I couldn't remember, this is year four, how many of our 122 ponds have we done? We've currently done 43 and we'll have 46 done by the end of the year. So we're making real progress on the renovation of our pond. 46 out of how many? Uh, 122. Mm -hmm. But you've also done some of the larger ones. <clears throat> There's a night here. Well, pond 34 is a big pond. <laughs> yes. So, and we started with the oldest pond. So we've primarily worked in the West Beach area and are working our way east um, because we started with the ones that had the most significant overgrowth. So in the reserve study, Shannon, to your point, the remaining 80 plus or minus ponds and the cost of their renovation over the coming years is going to be built into the reserve study. It's built in as a drain lines. on resource. Yeah. No pun intended. As drain a drain on resource. Yes, funny though. <laughs> it's in there now. It's just that now we're using it. Right. right. It's an allowance. Mm -hmm. So, but you had that question, so I wanted no, to I, make sure I answered. It's a great, it's a great, it's a very good answer. It's just I think in real life the the dividing line between maintenance. Oh, it's and great. LCI is it's really, great. Is really tricky. It's great. And we will, and Tony and I have talked about this a great deal as he's moved into operations. Like you have a $1 million drainage allowance, right? Where you're repairing metal pipes all the time. And sometimes the engineers get excited about that million dollars. And they chuck 800 in there or 600 in there. And we pull that account all the time. 6410 is my favorite account in the reserves. <laughs> And we pull it and we look at it and we go, oh, look, 800 bucks. Nope, operating, nope, operating. And we sit there and move it out because that million dollar allowance is for major renovation on your drainage system. So we won't allow those small expenses, that gray area to be charged against the reserve that should be charged against operating. Look, at the end of the day, it's, yeah. all, come, it's all coming out of the same pocket. It's just yeah. how we allocate it and be sure that long term, yes, sir. future homeowners yes, are, sir. you know, properly reserved for those yes, costs in the future. That's well, really what we're trying to do. Sure. Well, it, and it's also not, setting. Not exactly. Because maintenance is coming out of the operating. 
Okay. Me. No, no, I'm saying, but at the end of the day, it's coming out of the same pot. I mean, when I say the same pocket, the same homeowners. Okay. Yes. I mean, it's, came, it's coming out of the same homeowners. And you say, well, what's the difference if you put it out of here? Well, the difference is we want to be sure that, you know, future homeowners are reserved properly. That's that's basically, and that's, even though it's coming out of the same, we're charging the same people. It's yes. not that we're rolling you guys, different people. Yeah, yeah. you so guys today. It's not that some people are paying here, yes. some people are paying here. All of them are paying the same. It's just how we allocate. All of you are paying for the rejecting of the Summer yeah, Islands Bridge. We don't, you know, we don't cheat in any right. way for future. I mean, that's basically what. Uh -huh. okay. Ian, I have a quick question. This is Dale. Um, do you have a, and I, I'm pretty sure I've seen it in your work, but do you have like a five, 10 year type projection for those reserve items that uh, will need work that yes. you feed to the staff that they can plan and make sure that we have the reserve mm -hmm. adequately planned. Mm -hmm. I, sure, I yeah. So, I think I've seen it. He has it by year. Yeah, so we've got two charts and I can just share that real quickly. So there's a couple of things that we have in our um, in our reserve study that allows you to plan for that. So the the, the largest, which we, we briefly touched on, um, and this is kind of the executive summary, but just repeated for uh, 30 years is this chart right here. So this is the estimated, again, this is your, that, that gray box that we initially started with. That's what this line is repeated 30 times. Um, and then when you go down to the next section here, I'll just hop down to one that looks a little busier. Um, this is year over year, your cash flow for each reserve component. So. The zero, we're not expecting a project to happen that year. And then you see down here some smaller projects. Um, so this is kind of the cash flow detail of every Perfect. reserve study. I was looking item. for the details that uh, sub substantiates or supports the, the cash outflow, outflow projection each year so that that really helps staff and right. projecting and anticipating. Yeah, and so, and, and at each one of these, at each header of each right. section, you basic now obviously most clients it just goes to you know one page you guys have multiple pages for each year so you've got your starting reserve balance your annual contribution your interest earnings and then once you go down through all of these projects um you know year over year sorry i'm i'm scrolling through to show you so i don't lose my place um you have your estimated reserve expenses for that year now this number then goes back up to the top or sorry, the, start, the ending reserve balance gets back up to the top for 2027. And then we start fresh again. And then for the next year, here's your estimated reserve expenses. So that's- Thank you. You, you answered my question. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Yep, so we have that cash flow detail in there as well, so. All right, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, Ian, it's uh, Paul Huff uh, hey, again. Paul. I think no this, is a, this is a question uh, for anybody who happens to know the answer and it's, born only out of curiosity, but do we, uh, do you know how much Kika pays your firm each year for the services that you all provide? Just curious what the amount is. Do I know? Yeah. Oh, I, of course. Yeah, I know. So we, um, we basically have done a flat rate. Um, so most clients, we have two, two different types. It's either, um, it's either all up front and then you do two years of basically free and it's not free, but paid for already NSVs. We spread those costs out evenly. So I believe our contract right now, I think is 9,700 each year for three years. Right. So, <laughs> so it's, um, and to be honest, it's a, I mean, for an associate to this size, I really wanted to, to, to be a, a reserve study provider to you all. So, um, I'll just to give you an example, a normal small HOA, <laughs> A pool area, simple, maybe a couple hours site inspection. Our average report costs about twenty seven hundred. When we did this report on site years ago, um, we were on site for about three and a half days for for two guys. So it was uh, obviously quite a large undertaking, and that was kind of a hybrid with site visit. It wasn't even a start from scratch thing. So anyway, that's okay. our. Uh, Thank you. That's yeah, helpful. No problem. No problem. Appreciate it. And you pay for that out of your reserve fund. It's part of your infrastructure inspections to pay the upkeep of your reserve study. All right, any other questions? Um, okay, so Ian, uh, so we expect to get the uh, year-end 2021 report. 
The, dr the uh, draft here. Yeah, Sean. the draft. So again, we're going to provide a draft with the understanding that the numbers are going to change, especially by the end of Q4. I just like the idea that we're already in 2022. Let's get a fresh reserve study for 2023. So using the current numbers that we have with the understanding what projects we're expecting to occur, <laughs> some might get pushed, some might get adjusted. That's why we'll do a revision again later in the year. So your draft will, my, my goal is to get it to you all within a week. Um, and then we can slowly kind of tweak that over the year and Shannon and I will work on that. Yeah. And then, well, our, our main goal is before we get in the process of budgeting to be sure that, you know, that reserve uh, number matches our budgeting for 2023. Okay, so, okay, so, so do okay. you want to do it? Um, so, uh, you want me to work with Ian to tweak because you know he and I just kind of generally talked about fourth quarter. If you look at your schedule, if we adjust your funding again, because your funding's been so volatile, if we adjust your funding again in October, that would put it in before your October twenty sixth budget meeting. Does that work? Well, I think I would want it at that. Is it that the where we uh, we agreed on? Uh... The, the uh, no, the budget guidelines and assumptions. I think that you want it in September. Yeah. Okay. For the you know because that's the meeting where we will sit with management and decide okay what assumptions what guidelines to use in the budget process for 2023. Okay. By that time we should have a, that number so that you can incorporate it in your budget process. All right. So Ian, we'll look to do an update on numbers in September. Sure. Question though, real quick, with home sales. When a home is sold, is a portion immediately dropped into reserves or is that put into an isolated account that's put in at the end of the year? Nope, immediately goes. Okay, all right, cool. So we'll have numbers on that as well. Okay, no yeah. problem. But we'll see We'll see your draft in the next couple of weeks. Yep, yep. And, so then that... we'll, and then I'll work with Tony and Ian and Paul and Paul if there's things we need to treat, tweak in there. Sure. And then um, we'll issue the final to you. Right. And then you can update it in September. So we can go, yeah. And so we can post a new one. Yep. In any event. Sure. Because right now we still have the year in uh, mm -hmm. 2020, right? We have, I thought we had 21 up there as well. Or, or, okay, yeah. yeah, 2021. We I'm have sorry. 21 up there. Uh, that's right. Yeah. 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 So we'll post this one and then we'll plan September to update numbers, particularly revenue numbers. And then Tony will update, yes, projects are on track based on what Ian expected, or we've pushed something, or we've accelerated something. Um, but that's a relatively minor update for Ian to make. Yep. All right, Ian. Cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, We're absolutely. Good. It's went well. I appreciate me. everybody's input, everybody's volunteer time. It's I know it's a lot. So, um, yeah, let me know how I can help. Shannon will be in touch fairly soon here. and. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you, Ian. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Ian. So, Alex, I, I guess the question now is, um, is what is management's recommendation on? Do we continue with Ian's firm? Do we go out and get bids on this work? Uh, where, where do we go? What, that's a good thing. Because Paul asked a, a relative, you know, an, you know, an interesting question. I don't know where you were heading with that uh, is it something that we need to consider or not? I think just as a matter of practice, and we have it in our financial controls manual, is you should be putting a vendor like this out for bid every three to five years. And I think we've had it for three years. Right? This is so the third year, yes. I think this would be somewhere between now and the next two years. We should. <laughs> and he's on a three year contract right okay, now. So uh, his contract is. His current contract expires at the end of this year. At the end of 22. Yes, sir. So He's on a three-year contract. So, Alex, I, I, I agree with Grant. I, I think this is so important um, that we should put it out to bid, not just for, for cost issues, you know, make sure that we're paying market rents, um, but also in terms of functionality. Um, it's, it's, it's analogous to an auditor, you know, having new, fresh set of eyes, I think is uh, very important. Okay, I, 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 don't, I mean, I don't have, I, I, you know, I want to listen to management's recommendation, but I agree yeah. that 
We have we have a manual. We have a policy that says policy. that we have to put it out to bid every three years, yeah, and sure. um, Ian's contract's up anyway. He's expecting us to go out to bid. Now, you know, maybe we come back and say, you know what, we really like Ian. We think he's smart. We think he's doing a good job. We want to keep him. His prices are in line. There's nothing to preclude that. So, but I think we, if, mm -hmm. if that's after we get competitive bids. Yes. And after you get competitive yes, bids. And yes, then sir. you you come back and you say, look, you know, right. somebody came in a hundred dollars less, but we still would like to. Right. Then I think that a hundred dollars less, I wouldn't jump. Because... No, no, but I'm just giving you an right. example. Whatever. Oh, there's, a, there's a cost. There. There's, there's a there. cost there to switch a reserve oh, specialist. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> yeah. But but, yeah. Uh, but I think it's good practice. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that's I mean, good I, so personally, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you can do it as a matter of protocol, but um, you know his firm is nationally recognized. Yes. He's intimately involved, um, um, and it's honestly ninety seven hundred dollars a year is a is a pretty economical charge for something like the work that uh, that he does. So. My own personal view is you you can go do all that work, but I wouldn't expend a huge amount of management's time doing it. I think their time is better spent focused on uh, more important things for the the association. Just one person's view. Yeah, I, I hear you, Paul. I, but I, I you know going out and you know just taking a look at what you know is out there in the market uh, quickly, yeah. and then you guys come back with. You know, when we switched to Ian's firm, we were unhappy with our previous reserve special. We were so unhappy. We were unhappy with our previous reserve specialist. We had had a, a long term <laughs> reserve specialist. He became ill. He unfortunately suffered a stroke, was no longer able to take care of us. We didn't like the replacement specialist that we had. So we were actively looking at lots of reserve companies and in detail to select a Yen's company. You know, certainly we have to go out to bid. We have to go back to Ian and figure out what his price would be anyway. Um, but I agree with Paul. I'm not actively seeking to switch companies. Um, I don't have any but complaint about Ian. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I understand. Yep. But I think we ought to just touch the market to see, sure. you know, get ourselves, you know, just to. I think we just have to follow up before the end. Yeah, follow, we have to follow, follow up before the end. That's right. So then if we do it, Brief and succinct manner. So you can yeah. with Paul. Okay. All right. So we understand before the year, before year end, we need to have management come back and uh, yep. give us a recommendation. We can do it. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry. So Paul has I, did, I just wanted to make a, a couple of observations. Um, and this primarily relates to um, what I believe is a significant fairness issue. First of all, I did not like the fact that Ian refers to other HOAs. M most other HOAs are bear no resemblance to the size, scale, scope, sophistication of Kiowa uh, or Kika. So I, I think it's completely irrelevant. And by saying that, you know, typically he sees reserve funding of whatever. Uh, we shouldn't take any comfort from that, but that's, that's an aside. The issue that I want to raise is that I believe that as a matter of fairness, the um, current homeowners, current members of HECA should pay an annual assessment equal to their use of the infrastructure. And that number is the annual rate of deterioration, which is calculated in this report. The only way, the only way that you can keep up with uh, funding future costs, absent special assessments, is meaningful assessment increases. That's the only way it can happen, mathematically, arithmetically. And so, what has happened in the past and what we are perpetuating um, or, or maybe perpetuating by virtue of the fact that we're 50% funded or 60% funded or less than 100% funded 
is that um, we are not paying our fair share as current homeowners. And if I think I confirmed this with, with Ian during our discussion at the workshop, that if an association always charges its members the annual cost of uh, deterioration, even though the expenditures might not take place for five years, or 10 years, or 15 years, you should never have a special assessment. And um, you shouldn't have extraordinary increases in your uh, annual assessments. If you look at the forecast that's built into his work, you will see beginning in year six through 25, you will see very sharp increases in the annual assessment contribution to the reserve. So I think what's happening now, and I, I, don't, I think it's inadvertent, but I think it's real, is that by having a quote unquote underfunded reserve position, current uh, members have enjoyed and will enjoy a lower cost of rent for our infrastructure than is appropriate. And I think this is an issue that not only the Finance Committee, but the board needs to uh, grapple with. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm looking at it cockeyed, but I don't think so. And I asked, I asked Ian specifically uh, during the workshop, and he agreed with me. Um, Ian's point is, look at it's a big association. You have lots of, he didn't use the word rich, but rich members. And so what's the problem with, you know, and a, a sharply ascending uh, uh, funding assessment in the future? Well, the problem is that it's not fair. So I just, I feel strongly about this. It's not something we're going to resolve today, but um, I think it's something that the Finance Committee and the board needs to come to grips with. So are you proposing that we sharply increase the assessments for current members? Uh, I'm, to be 100% funded? I'm, I am. 100% uh, funded up to depreciation amount, basically what he's saying. Yeah. No, so there, there are two parts to this. There are yeah, two, he's going, yeah. There are two parts to this. First of all is the past, <clears throat> okay? In the past, by virtue of the fact that we're, whatever the number is, 50, 60% funded, the, the homeowners in the past did not pay the full amount of the annual cost of de deterioration. Okay, right, because our, our goal was 50 to 60. That's, that's right. just a historical fact. Otherwise, we'd be 100% funded. Otherwise, we'd be 100% funded. You know, exactly. Right. Now, there, I, think, I think you can deal with this in two pieces, Bram. First, the, the issue, the first issue is, do we agree that as a matter of fairness, the, the, the um, current homeowners should pay the annual cost of deterioration? And by the way, that annual cost of deterioration will, will change over time as our replacement cost values uh, change. That's step number one. And then step number two is to face squarely and objectively and openly what do we do about the fact of the subsidy that past homeowners have enjoyed at the expense of current and future homeowners? Those are, those are separate but very related issues. I think they can be viewed separately, but they both need to be addressed. But the second one, Paul, how do you address that? You're going, you're going to go back to the old homeowners and say, listen, we got to collect well, how are you going to, you know, you, I think you got to, you know, the past is the past. We got to go future, the future, not the past. I, I, look at how are you going to, how are you going to deal with that? I, I don't, I don't, I don't have, a, it's a great question. It's the key question, Alex. I don't have, I don't, it's many I don't of them have, are gone, by the way. I, many of them are gone. I understand that. And that's why we shouldn't continue the practice. I hear you, but, I'm saying, but I think the second one is the one that I think we ought to deal with it one by <laughs> one. The second goal, I think, is, it's unrealistic for us to even to try to challenge. Right. It, what's, re, what's realistic is for the finance committee and the board <laughs> to accept the fact that historically homeowners have been subsidized. 
I think, I think that's, that is a reality. Then the question is, you know, too bad? Or do we actually chip away at that? But, okay. But you want to be at 100%. I, I, as a matter of fairness, I see no reason, I see no reason for us not to be at 100%. And I, and I think not to be at 100% it not only implies, you can see it in the numbers, future share, future homeowners are gonna pay a lot more. They don't know it. But I asked Ian this question at the uh, our workshop, right? What was his response to I asked, well, what is, are we unusual in terms of how funded we are? And he yes, said, yes, because small homeowners, Right. Small they, they HOAs agree. Don't all HOAs have to be a hundred percent? They don't have a choice. <laughs> but most HOAs are way lower. So oh, way he, lower, and they know that there's going to be a special assessment. Yeah, and he said in the workshop, you guys are actually on the much higher side of your funding. And then he said, I don't recommend you go to a hundred. It's not realistic. I forgot, it's not realistic. I forgot what he said. What the logic was, quite frankly. But I remember him saying, you don't. Getting into the 70s is really good. You're very unique there, like extremely unique there. And and I and I'm sure that it, as a as a as a practical observation is true. That doesn't erase, that doesn't obviate the, the question of fundamentally, how do we want the funding of our forget mom and pop HOAs? That's not relevant. It shouldn't be relevant. We, this is a real issue. And I, and I think we need to address it at a policy level and we need to um, have it be addressed at the board. Yeah, and maybe the right way to also look at this is to get a better idea of for an HOA like Kika, if there is comparables out there, what is the standard? And to try and say, we might not be at a but if the standard is 60% or 70 or 80%, we should at least strive for that standard or to be above that. So I, I think that's fair, but I, I don't know about being at a hundred. I, I, I don't think that's realistic. And I don't even think anybody else is there. I don't, I don't know who, what other organizations are at a hundred. So if is the 23 million, is that if all those projects came due now, it'd be $23 million out of our reserve. Or is that a discounted number? That's a discounted number. Yeah. So we can certainly go to other, certainly it's easy to go in our region, right? We know the large scale associations that are here in our region, you know, Hilton Plantation, Palm of Dunes, Sea Pines. Um, uh, so we can go to some of them, Seabrook, and ask, what is your current target for? funding level and what are you currently at? And we could at least do a quick comparison regionally. I could ask Ian if he can do it nationally with you know even their clients who are on the scale uh, that Kika is on. It would at least give you some feeling of where you are. Yeah, I, I agree, I, I, I agree. I mean, we need to, you know, in lieu of taking that position, now let's go to 100%. Well, why would we be at 100 so, so I, I I guess I have a slightly different perspective on this. And I, I might challenge some of the basic assumptions that you're making, uh, Paul, in your uh, in your statements. But to me, I mean, looking at other HOAs is interesting, but at the end of the day, you know, that's their set of problems. We have to do what's right for our members and our financial health and stability. You know, one thing that would be interesting to understand is if you look back in time, you know, how many special assessments over the last 40 years or 20 years, how many special assessments have we had? Because when you have a, a multiple set of years where you don't have a special assessment, the reserve reserve methodology and the, and the economics kind of suggest it's working. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've had special assessments as it relates to storms. Okay, put that to one side. That's a different uh, different issue. But if on average over time, over the last 20 years, we have this constant churn 
of special assessments, then that would suggest there's something wrong with the whole model. I don't necessarily think that's true, but we should get the facts around it. Um, because if we're not doing special assessments, then the model is sort of generally working at the top of the house. It may not be you know, perfect at an individual project level, but it's working at the top of the house. Um, and going to 100% just seems uh, counterintuitive relative to that. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to think. I think Paul, it's bad. I'm trying to think, and I, I can't think of an instance in the last 20 years where we did something for infrastructure, but I need to sit down and think about it. We certainly did for new infrastructure, but right. I don't remember us doing it for instance. Um, Existing. Right. X road failed. So we went to the membership and said X road failed and we need you to cough up cash. Um, I mean, that's, you know, doing some fact testing. Yeah, I doing mean, even some... when even when the the parkway came in unexpectedly at eight hundred thousand dollars, and we the board said, "Yeah, we hate the parkway. We hate what you did related to the base, and we don't like it. And we want to spend eight hundred thousand dollars and repave the parkway." You remember the bumps? So, and we didn't go to the membership in special sense. So, so Shannon, you're hitting on a, a very important point. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons that there haven't been special assessments that could apply in the future as well is growth. Sure. So as your homeowner membership base Absolutely. continues to grow and as the mania around real estate sales continues to grow, that solves, quote unquote, a lot of problems. Sure. Also, special assessments tend to come when your infrastructure is old relative to your infrastructure being not so old. Sure. So the question is, at some point, the growth in Kiowa, because every last inch of turf has been developed, it will be flat. Yes. And the and the and the CTR, aka real estate sales tax, is going to stop being crazy. Is going to stop being crazy. <laughs> so those those factors are also those factors are also important. important for us to consider. But I would I would also make the comment, and I you know obviously I've been coming to finance committees for a long time. Um, I remember when we started into the metal drainage. And we were like, oh, my God, we have all this metal drainage. Metal drainage is 40 plus years old. We're a 46 year old community. So metal drainage is 46 years old. And so we've already hit, just as an example, right, Paul, um, we've already <laughs> hit a major failure in our infrastructure, which was the corrugated metal pipe sitting in salt water for 40 years. But we have been managing through that with our reserves, and that's your million dollar allowance that you have right now, um, to handle failures in a major asset that we have. I mean, drainage, if you look at that percentage of what drives the reserve study, drainage is whoo, way up there. So we have been managing through the failure of a major asset for Kiowa Island without going to a special assessment as Paul Huff states. But you do also have safety in numbers too. And, and so, you have safety in growth. Yes, you do. And that and but and, we did go through a period of years no, I understand. with very difficult I, I understand. Numbers. But yeah. but the but reserve expenditures by their nature are back end weighted. And again, okay. all you have to do is look at the well, sure. forget the last report. The next report we'll get hopefully we'll get soon. Numbers. Look at look at the for, look at the long term forecast for for contributions. Yeah, it's a sharp increase. It is, and and we don't disclose that to the membership explicitly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in some of those years that are coming is you you own eight vehicular bridges, right? God bless the eight. I know Brand loves our vehicular bridges. 
Um, but we own eight, seven of which are wooden. <laughs> and those vehicular bridges are extraordinarily expensive. Right. And those vehicular bridges have a life expectancy in the reserve study to completely replace both the superstructure and the substructure of those bridges, right? Complete replacement. Now, Kika, because God knows we don't want to get to that point, keeps inspecting your bridges so that we're making routine um, uh, preventative maintenance on your bridges so that hopefully we are not doing complete replacements of your superstructures and substructures on those vehicular bridges. But you're right, in the reserve study, we have to represent those numbers, right? We have to represent that all seven of those bridges are going to be replaced in a two-year period because those are the years they were installed. Right. But, and so but we're, not... trying to, we're trying to mitigate some of these really awful expenses that right. are represented in your out years right. by doing preventative maintenance and inspections now. Yeah. But but Shannon, again, I applaud you for the for the, those efforts. We're trying. No, 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 I'm serious. I'm serious. I applaud no. you and your staff for doing that. The reserve study should include future expenses that we really think are going to be there. Our best estimate. If we think they're wildly conservative, that's not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. No, I think the reserve specialist does the best estimate. He always has said he's always the best estimate. He's not going to be ultra conservative right. or over, you know, that's basically what he said. Correct. All right, look, I think this conversation can go on. Uh, there's no doubt. There's nothing we can do about the reserve fund right now. I mean, this is a budget process that if we make a decision to increase reserve that's going to have to be in the budget process for us to go to the members and say we need x more if we decide to do so if we if we decide to stay as you know, on course as we are now and go with the reserve specialist recommendation then we stay with the research specialist so i think we got to wait for the the new study continue to dialogue with this and, and when uh, the budget process comes uh what it does what it what it, what, what it does uh point out though is uh, perhaps the language that the board inserted about maintaining up to 50% um, may not actually be helpful or appropriate on an on average over time okay. uh, horizon. So I, well, I know that you've, you've mentioned with reference that you believe that on the, on the webpage, the wrong reserve policy that was approved by the board, by the, approved by the board I mean, eventually approved by the finance committee, then approved by the board, uh, is the incorrect one. What I think what we need to do is for you and, and Paul Hennessy to take a shot at it again. I mean, I've said this many times, all of our policies are not in stone. I mean, we no, can change true. them, we can review them. If we need to review it again, let's do so. And let's come back you know, to the finance committee and then back to the board with your recommendations on the changes to that policy. So yeah, well, you... okay, sorry, sorry. So we know what those changes are. It's the policy that we approved. So I, I don't know how much more work needs to be done uh, unless people don't think that the policy that the finance committee approved is adequate. And if that's the case, then then we can do some more work. The point well, I was making, the point, the point I was making was different from that issue about what's on the website. Um, the point I was making is that in in the the board when they approve the policy put specific language in it around maintaining up to 50% reserve levels. And my point that I was making building off of this conversation that Paul Hennessy has been leading is that may not actually be helpful language in the policy. So that's um, because on a year to year basis, and, and honestly, the way that Jerry and I wrote the original policy was didn't have that language. We said for 2021, a 50% level was deemed to be appropriate, leaving we, ourselves the, the flexibility. Board, to, Paul, to, the, board, the board at, you know, 
at that level decided to make a change to the recommendation of the finance committee. Uh, You're right. That. But the board, the board decided to make that change. Now we can go back to the board and we'll say, look, we believe that no, that's incorrect. And you, you know, this well, I think that's what Paul suggested. Okay, yeah. so yeah. so so we uh, need to make a formal recommendation to the board that that that's not the word. So, so there were a couple, there were different versions. The version that's on the website is actually the version that went before the finance committee the last time and then went to the board of directors. But my understanding is there was another version. Jerry Honey said he made a mistake in what he sent to us, and there was another version. If we need to relook at that version, then we need to bring that back to finance, look at that version, make sure we're okay with it, and then send it to the board as a recommendation for change to the existing policy. I can't, I can't replace what's on the website right now because that's what my board voted on. Does that make sense? To, to me, they're, they're two separate issues. One is what's on, what the board approved. We can go yes. back and we can- Yes, they're separate you know, I've issues. Sent, I'll say I've sent you all the policy that Jerry and I think is the policy that the Finance Committee approved. And we, you know, we can, I'm sure we can go back to the Finance Committee meeting recording and, and take a look at it. Yeah, which element? That, that's, that's, one, that's, one, that's one issue we can solve that over time. The only point that I'm making is is totally different related to the conversation yes. that we're having based on Paul Hennessy's observation. Right now, the policy that's on the website that the board approved includes this threshold of up to 50%. And so we're going to have to revisit that if we fundamentally believe that we should be at 100%. Correct. Great. Right. Well, and, I, and further to that, the model that uh, Ian is using, if it's up to 50% and his model goes to 60%, then there's a little conflict in that right. too. Exactly. exactly. We're funding beyond what the board is approved. Exactly. So it, exactly. that's an inherent conflict as well. Yep. But maybe what would be helpful is, Paul, to your earlier point, that we, Chan goes back and looks and sees if we had any special assessments over a longer period of time that were outside of, the, outside of what the reserve handled or what we should have handled. And then likewise, I would still like to get the information. Are we kind of at the top end of reserve funding or not? And I, I think it is relevant to have that just as a sense of where, where we are mm -hmm. kind of for an organization of this size. And not comparing us to the townhome community because <laughs> right, right. Paul Hennessy is correct. Right. It's irrelevant. <laughs> Right. But I think I think with those two pieces of information, we can go into the budgeting process, having a better understanding of where we stand yeah. and, and what historically has been the case. Mm -hmm. All right. We can do that then, Chen. We can okay. do that, sir. All right. Then we'll come back. All right. You're helping. Let's move on to uh, item four on the agenda, the financial control manual. Now, we, we've been uh, working on this for several months now, so... Uh, we want to have a final document to the board to get this uh, to get this moving. I mean, there were some some minor changes and some substantial changes to the financial program. Uh, you all have a copy of the latest version uh, that was sent to you. Uh, in addition to that, you also received, uh, which is the last uh, the uh, the conflict of interest. Uh, the, the new word, the wording on the conflict of interest for uh, non-employees, officials, neons, you call them, yeah. neos, neos, yes. neos uh, the latest version of it. Uh, so can we move forward to the, uh, to the board for, uh, for approval now that we have the final versions of this? So Alex, I just had, I reread the, the financial control manual last night, and I just I had two questions and then a, a couple of observations. Okay. The two questions were: I thought we had agreed, and agreed may be too strong a term, but I thought we had agreed that we had done multi-year forecasts in Kia in, the, in Kika in the past. Yeah. And then we would do them in the future, but I didn't see any reference to multi-year. That's in a policy 
that's related to a policy that we have that we passed. Is it in the reserve policy? I think it's in the reserve policy that it says that. What? Okay, well, I'm not talking about the reserve, I'm talking about capital expenditures. Pika, Pika for it, 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 there was one for capital expenditures too, wasn't there? I think it, I, I know that capital we talked about is capital expenditure. I'm, looking at, I'm trying to remember where it's three months. years, three or four cash for capital expenditure, but I don't know if that has anything to do with controls anyway. The, the it wasn't in the financial how, how controls that, manual, it was in a policy we were reviewing. Oh, I, 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 part of the controls. Okay, I just thought that part of our financial controls is doing a peak of financial forecast more than one year. More in the budget process, though, but oh, I don't okay. think that's all right. right. I mean, fine. If, fine. The, the purpose of this is really for internal controls. Okay, fine. Okay. That's that's the purpose of the other. You're, you're correct. We put it into a policy. I just can't remember off okay. the top of my head which one it was. The other question was there is reference. There is reference in the financial controls manual to monthly financials, and I didn't think we were doing monthly financials. I thought we no. changed it to quarterly. Still, it still says monthly. Page, oh. chapter four, page seven. Thank you. It that should be it. definitely changed. That we talked about making that change. So yes, uh, definitely quarterly. Quarterly financial statements will be distributed to key staff finance committee board and host on But under the director of finance responsibility and preparing monthly financial statements. Well, he is still responsible for that. Oh, so we are doing monthly financial statements. He has to give me five monthly okay. financial okay. statements. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was my question. That's all. Management. Management. Okay, fine. Internal management, yes. Or David? <laughs> you still have to give me. Something financial. Oh, internal, yes. Five uh, Okay. I thought Paul was going to lessen my workload. Okay. No. So the, observ the observations that I would, the observations that I would make is, is the following, and it's it's an observation, and Alex, Shannon, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Sure. But One in page. three places in this document, um, there there is a discussion about. Um, issues that I don't really think belong in a financial control manual. So in chapter one, page four, there is a discussion about the relationship between the COO and the board. I mean, that's fine. Didn't, it didn't strike me as being relevant to a financial controls manual. In Wait, chap in chap cha chapter four? So chapter one, chapter one page four. So the board and the COO have the authority to charter committees comprised of PICA members to act in an advisory to the board and the COO. Committees do not have decision. Well, okay, <laughs> fine. And then, it, and then it goes on to discuss the, the responsibilities of the COO vis-a-vis -vis the board. Again, I don't object to that. Question is, is that in scope for a financial controls manager? But I guess it's just, a, like I said, delegation of authority to be sure where the authority lies. I mean, that's, that's the purpose of that control. Okay, that so authority to char charter committees should be in the financial control name. No, no, it's just, just the authority of the committee. The authority of the committee is not to make any decisions. It's to re recommend. Committees okay. do not that's have basically decision that's the, that's the, uh, this is This is just the an purpose. observation. Chapter 9, page 13. Page 13, coming. Ready? Chapter eight, page 13. Chapter nine, page 13. At the bottom, there is a description of the mandate of the finance committee, which is fine, except we approved or recommended and the board approved a finance committee charter that is different than chapter nine. Then it should be removed. That, that's incorrect. But I, I don't know why it's in here. Why would the financial controls manual Again, define the mandate of the finance committee? That's a board matter. I guess it was determined to it, determine their authority. Again, for control purposes, what authority they have. I mean, we can erase it completely or just put finance committee. Again, it's an observation. To me, it doesn't belong. I do. But either, either we agreed that we erase it completely and put finance committee C charter, you know. That's all, or we just erase it all together. I think, you know, we put it in for one, I think it was in there, right? 
That's right. That's right. In fact, in, when we, for, when we you adjust, inherited it. Yeah, we inherited it. And then second, I think it's just informational. So I, I don't know. Well, if, it, if it's just informational, it, it should be information that's correct. Well, I can go back to the charter and make sure that it's. Well, just the finance committee, see, ch see charter. I mean, you know, I mean, that's basically if you want to do that or include the charter if you want, but or correct some of these statements versus the charter. Uh, Okay. okay, and then finally, um, chapter nine, chapter 19, page 21, it talks about conflict of interest. And again, we're dealing with a conflict of interest policy. It just doesn't seem appropriate that the conflict of interest policy statement is in the financial controls manual. Should we have a conflict of interest policy? Well, I think, oh, I think, I I think, think it absolutely should. I think it should be in the financial I think that's paramount to it, actually, because part of the control okay. is actually stating there Fine. is a conflict of interest. Thank you. I, I, think it, I think it's important. All right, so the major changes to finance committee, we're going to check. Uh, I'll check on that right. before it goes to, because um, the board right now is slated to pass the financial controls manual on Monday. So we will um, make we the need changes. To, we need to institute this because it's just, yeah. it's been too many, that, you know, that's just- we, we It's been months. We just, we've had too many, too many, too many months. <laughs> Do you need to vote to approve it based yeah. on yeah. those yeah. changes? Um, Alex, Tony had a question for you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just an me. observation, and this is coming from my previous life in law enforcement. One of the challenges that we always had because we had so many, we had an operations manual. We had an administrative manual, we had an HR manual, yeah. and every one of them would start to, to talk about each of the policy components instead of like referring to the operations manual so that whenever that policy changed, you didn't have to go in and find out where else it was changed. Yeah. Um, so we found it easier and we actually reduced these stuff by just basically saying, if it was in another area, it just referred to it. And that way, if that changed, you only had to change that one document because it was already referenced. Yeah. We can, said, like, the we can we'll shorten up the finance committee and just reference charter. Right. Um, right. But That's I agree basically. with Brand that conflict of interest, we shouldn't outline what the conflict of interest policies say. We should reference that they exist and that everyone should complete that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree with that. Yep. All right. Or must. All right. So must based, complete. based on those changes, uh, do I have a motion to proceed to the board with the finance control manual? Moved. I have a second. Can I second since I helped draft? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Brian, you can. Jim, are you with us? Jim Delay, are you still with us? He's muted. They're muted. Uh, Paul's, no, I see Paul. Paul's got right, a so thumbs up. If Jim's there's no, other, no further discussion, um, all those that uh, approve uh, proceeding to the fund with the finance control manual to the board, we signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody against? Please. Okay. Okay. I guess Jim Jim left us. He yeah. said that at 11. Oh, that's he right. He's on the road. Yeah. That's right. He did. Yeah. He did. Okay. So, good. Good. All right. Uh, member comments. Yeah, that's right. Let's go to member comments. You have now. two members. Anybody has their hands raised? We have two members, Alex, but no one has their hands raised. Oh my God. Okay. Well, good. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. I, I spoke too soon. Luke, Luke What's, just raised his hand. hand. Oh. Luke Farrell. Luke, Luke. Okay, Luke. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. Um, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to attend. This has been a very interesting meeting. I uh, probably got a, since my investment experience has got a lot to do with um, uh, pensions and uh, actuaries. Uh, I might have some comments for you. I'll send you an email, Alex. But this has been okay. very interesting, and I just want to say thank you very much. Absolutely. for And and learn a little bit. Okay. Oh, well, there you are, Jim. Jim's back. Yep. Sorry, guys. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. I we can, Jim. We can record yeah. you as an I for the uh, the uh, financial yeah. control yeah. manual. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Good. I, had, I had one more quick point. I uh, I heard that there, we had um, some emergency funding needs from Sandcastle. Is that right? Mm -hmm. and so how, how much was that? Oh, how much was it? Um, I don't know the total. 
Um, so we had some pipe issues in the sandcastle. We had two. We had a pipe issue related to the kitchen drains. That's now been completed 30,000 ish. Um, so we, we've made those repairs. And then we had a leak. Um, you may remember we shut down the sandcastle real quick for a day. We had a leak in the fire suppression system. And so that caused some damage into the building because when the fire suppression system leaks, that's a lot of water really fast. And so that's the area that's closed beyond the gym. Right. And that is under an insurance claim right now, which we're working our way through. Okay. So at least 30,000, well, more significant, more than, more than 30,000. Right. But some of it's insurance coverage. Some of it will be insurance coverage. And you may remember that in the reserve budget, you hold $100,000 in there every year for emergency expenses related to your infrastructure. So we have charged the $30,000 right now against <laughs> repair um, emergency account. So my responsibility as the COO is then to report once we get all the total expenses in is to report to the board, we've used the emergency money, here's the total. Now the board of directors because they get weekly updates from me, they know that we're spending some of that money and they know that they've got an emergency repair going on down there and they know they have an insurance. Plan. Same thing for Otter Island and uh, Road Corps. Yeah. Now, are you guys supposed to report that to the finance committee as well? Uh, or is there like a break? I'm just curious because like- We certainly could tell you if you'd like, but um, my requirement is to the board of directors. Okay. I'm just curious about. I mean, thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand is fine. If it, if it was like a hundred thousand. Yeah, because I'd exceed my, what I have available. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she had to. She had to get. I have to tell you. Okay. <laughs> you got to get okay. 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 I was just curious if it was sizable or not. But yeah. I, so I was, I was there and I was you know, yeah. Talking. Ellen, I see another hand up. Is that right, uh, Michael? Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Michael Petrucka. Right? Yep. Yeah. Michael, um, Michael, you should Alex. be unmuted. Yes, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, thank yes, you. we can First hear you. Alex, to, to echo Luke's comments, um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was an excellent discussion. Um, and certainly I know Paul would probably have the same thing. I have some thoughts on the reproposal process, but I think the way the committee operated was absolutely outstanding. So thank you for allowing me to, to listen in. Oh, good, thank you. All right. And that's it, Alex. All right, before we adjourn, anybody have any other comments? We're gonna go into executive session, so. Uh, all right, if we, uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. All right, second, second. All those in favor, all signals right. five is saying aye, agree. Okay, nobody all opposed. Right. All right, Alan, uh, you need to shut it down. <laughs> so we'll go into uh, executive session. Thank you, Luke, thank you, uh, Michael. There you go. Now you just have Jim on. Did we lose Paul? Yeah, Paul, Paul stepped off, but you still have Jim. You still with us, Jim? I'm, st I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. Still here. Okay. Yeah. And your participants are gone. So. Okay. All right. So um, the work group of, uh, made up of uh, Jeff Porter, Brand, myself, and Dale, uh, we received 22 applications for the Finance Committee. 22. They heard about the donuts. <laughs> That's it. 20, 22, 22 applications. And we went through a process of banking shortlists. Uh, we, we weren't going to go through the process of interviewing 22 people. We didn't think that that was, that was reasonable. Oh, there's Paul. Uh, he's back. Okay. You're back, Paul? Okay. Did you hear what I just said, Paul? No, sorry. I just, so for some reason, just got dropped from the Zoom call. So. Okay. All right. So I mentioned that. Uh, you know, the, the work group of uh, Bran, uh, Jeff Porter, myself, and Dale, uh, we went through the 22 applications we received. We received 22 wow. applications. Yeah, wow. 20, yeah, for two, for two slots. Uh, yeah. And uh, basically, we went through a process of going to a short list. We, we agreed that we weren't going to interview 22 people and uh, reviewing uh, their backgrounds, uh, basically their, you know, uh, their work, their uh, their history, volunteer work, et cetera, et cetera. 
people that have been on the finance committee before, people that are on other committees presently. Uh, so we went through that whole process and we came up to a short list and then we interviewed, uh, we interviewed four people. Uh, and uh, of the four people, uh, we recommend that uh, Michael Petreka. Oh, the gentleman uh, that just spoke. Yes. And uh, Debbie Biddle, uh, we would recommend uh, to the Finance Committee to go to the board as the new uh, members of our committee. Uh, Debbie is a CPA also. Uh, she presently still is part time. Both are really part time, uh, spending more than 50% of their time here on the island. Okay, they're long term, long term residents of the island. Uh, one lives on Turnberry, the other one lives on Atlantic Beach. Uh, they're both very active, uh, semi retired, not fully retired, both of them. Uh, Still acting, you know, in in uh, in their in their practices as, as CPAs. Uh, we interviewed them, you know, had extensive questioning, etc. Who were the four uh, interviewed? Pardon me. Who were the four that were interviewed? Uh, Todd, the other one was uh, Todd Boney. Todd Boney. Todd Boney, who you know, and then Jeffrey Cook. What's the other? So we want to be sure that we keep this information confidential, right, Paul? Uh, I, I think the one other thing to stress is, you know, the, the 22 applicants, for the most part, I'd say there is 20 of them that probably could have, uh, from a professional perspective, added <laughs> to the committee. Yes. So what we were really also looking for is not someone that is just going to be a professional ad, but also, you know, the right attitude and a good fit for the committee. So um, just further to Alex's comments, we really, that was a focus to ensure that we had the right fit of person. And we're also looking for a little bit of diversification in our professional skill set. and having an additional CPA was something that we definitely wanted to have. We only have Jeff right now. So that we felt that was prudent given all of the things that we deal with. So uh, the recommendation is that Debbie be appointed to the one year term uh, that uh, Jerry, uh, that uh, the uh, Jerry, honey. Jerry, 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 yeah, Jerry, that's right, Jerry, uh, left us with, and that uh, Michael Petreka be appointed to the three year term left of uh, of Lisa. So that's our recommendation. So, I, I would just say, how, how did you decide who was going to be appointed to which of those terms? Was there any method to that, or just a random? Uh, Lisa well, actually mentioned yeah one year. De yeah, yeah, Debbie. De I'm Debbie, sorry, Debbie. Debbie mentioned you know that she would could do one year or three years, but one of the things she said is she wanted to kind of make sure she she had a good feel for the committee. And she, her preference, I think, was really to do the year term. So that that was simple. Okay. Right. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was her comment too, in a way that. Uh, uh, she's, she's presently the treasurer of her uh, of her homeowners, her, her regime in uh, the uh, the Turtle Beach, uh, uh, the village of, of Turtle Beach. She's the treasurer there right now. So, uh, so that's how basically there wasn't any specific formula for, but it was more. She gave us like an open, like a, she opened the door a little bit. Okay. Uh, Michael, Michael had she never she never answered the question with reference to one or three years. Michael did. Michael did say you know the three year term. Okay, so uh, very specific. So she sort of left it open to us. So I, I don't know either Michael or Debbie, and I have no reason to think they wouldn't be excellent. I, I have to say I was I've been terribly impressed by by Mr. Boney, who has contributed as a as a as a community member on a number of. Occasions, I thought extremely thoughtfully. So, anyway, that's yeah. my two cents. We 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 took that in consideration. It was uh, you know it was it was a discussion. Paul, I can show you it was a discussion. It wasn't. Uh, but at the end of the day, we we came to the conclusion that these two people were a better fit to our committee. What we we're looking for, we need. Uh, particularly, we have so much accounting that that's going on that goes on in the finance, the CPA element. 
give us a longer view, you know, having uh, Richard now as the three year uh, the CPA, we know we're going to have somebody who will spill over Jeff, who's only he's the only CPA on. So several, so there were several items, but but we took that all in consideration. We, it was we, not we, easy. We, it was not easy. Huh? Huh? We we agree with you that Todd it, Todd yeah. added a lot of value to this conversation. It wasn't easy, and, and it was a it was a the, the debate and discussion about it. You know, certainly I think he does. So hopefully, you know, he. If there's more openings in the future, that they'll come back. Well, I, I just I just hope that the, that the selection process was based on who could make the, the best contribution. Yeah, I can assure you that was the, that was the only that that's, that was that was it that was that was the only. Thing. So, unless there's any objections, then uh, I will proceed to a recommendation of the board. This is still to remain confidential uh, until the board gives a formal approval. Which we will meet. We meet on Monday uh, to do so, and probably announce it on, on Monday afternoon. But this is this isn't a committee recommendation. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we as a subgroup are recommending to the committee, and the finance committee now will submit the names to the board. That's well, I have no problem with that. But it typically the committee votes on something, and well, that, I, if you would like a vote, I just said unless there's any objections. You know, I will proceed. No, I, I, I have no objection. Okay, so just, Jen, do you have any objections? Uh, Paul? No, I'm good. I'm good, Alex. Okay, okay. so no objection. So we can register as a vote, you know, in the executive committee minutes uh, that we took a formal vote and it was unanimous to. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm saying just the opposite. Alex, if you and, and your, the co your colleagues here have made a decision. I'm fine with that. I have no objection, but I can't vote on something that I have no, I have, no, I have no uh, knowledge about. I, I, I know nothing about Michael and Debbie, so how can I vote that they're the best choice? Okay, well, whatever, however, you know, however you want to register, you, if you want the minutes to show, you have no objection to the recommendation of the subgroup. That's what you want to show. Well, I mean, that's that's the truth. Maybe okay. You know, you know, if that's the way you want your vote to be shown, that's fine. You have no, no objection to the recommendation. I have no so, objection. Okay. All right, Paul, Jim, we're okay? Okay. All right. We're good. We're good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we'll see you uh, in, a, in about a month. <laughs> you have the, I'm sure that Ellen's going to be sending all of us the, uh, the, the, uh, the calendar for the year. So that you all have it. You can register the, those minutes. Okay. And, and hopefully we'll be seeing soon the uh, reserve study. Oh yeah, as soon as it's as soon as it heats issue it, you know, I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy. Of course. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Now I can say.